All right, let's try this again. What are problems and obstacles restructuring a cannabis business in the U.S. and in Canada? Today, that's what we're going to discuss. We're going to review those difficulties, and uh, hopefully this works out. Welcome to Martinis with Scott, episode 19, coming to you live from Lizard Creek Lodge in beautiful, Fermi, British Columbia. My only problem out here is, is production. I have no uh, internet. Um, the lighting sucks. Um, all my equipment fails, so I'm trying this again. I'm sorry for the false starts on uh, this live production, but let's see how we do. Fading off on, on the uh, music here. Um, nobody's serving you today, but cheers. Um, hope you enjoy your drink on a Thursday afternoon. Not only is everything going wrong production-wise, but I'm running out of I'm running out of proper alcohol, so I only have a little sip of uh, uh, Fernie Distillery vodka left, and I threw in some Fernie Distillery gin um, that has some unique fall flavors, uh, and I've mixed the two together, and it's quite good. Um, so at least I have that going for me. <clears throat> please, uh, so we're episode 19 of Martinis with Scott. Please remember to subscribe. We are on uh, we are on YouTube uh, live. Uh, we're all. Also, the podcast version is on Apple and Spotify. So subscribe uh, for those, uh, subscribe at those services. So we're going to talk about cannabis companies today. I know what you're saying. I'm sick of cannabis. You've done two on CanTrust. You did one on Afria. It's been nothing but cannabis all the time around here. I understand uh, this will be the maybe the last one in a little while, um, but this is an issue coming down the pipe, uh, restructuring of cannabis-based companies. And also, uh, I'm preparing this week for a seminar. We, we are, Sinclair Range is co-hosting uh, next week, um, next Tuesday in Toronto. Uh, and one of the, one of the panels uh, that I'll be talking to some lawyers, uh, uh, the subject of that panel will be cannabis restructuring. So this was a way for me to do some research and make sure that I'm current and up to speed. And on that point, uh, we're filming here. I'm filming here September 12th, 2019. This is a fast moving area of law. And so if you watch this uh, three months from now, it may not be current. So be aware of that. Also, uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a turnaround guy. I'm a, I'm a business expert. And the Martinis with Scott channel, uh, I should have mentioned at the beginning, is about helping business owners and management and entrepreneurs um, win at business. Uh, so this is not a legal advice channel and restructuring of what we're going to talk about today has a lot to do with law. Um, so, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Um, but clearly we, uh, clearly I'm involved in these restructuring and I have some insight into what's going on. So what drives the need uh, for restructuring? And is this really going to be an issue? Why haven't we seen a bunch of restructurings in the cannabis space already? And the answer to those questions is is debt or lack of debt. Um, in the industry in Canada, if we can look at that, has been funded uh, almost entirely uh, with equity in the last several years, like from the start of the industry today. It's almost been entirely equity. We were valuing uh, LPs, um, uh, so licensed producers. Um, we, we were valuing them based on the capacity, how big they were, how much cannabis they're going to grow, and and it was an equity play. And the really the only debt that was um, that you know was part of the industry, similar to the U.S., would be mortgages on the real estate or the greenhouse, and maybe some equipment financing. Nobody was selling very much, so there, or if they were, it was largely cash. So there wasn't much in terms of accounts receivable or inventory that a bank would normally lend on. And um, and so this has been an equity play almost from day one. And when it's purely equity, there's nothing to work out or restructure. You have to have debt. Um, but that's changing. And it's changing because um, certainly in Canada, if we can look at that, the, the LPs that are successful, let's look at uh, Aurora, for example, are getting much larger and they're diversifying. So Aurora Cannabis has, uh, by my count this morning, 32 subsidiaries um, owned or pending. And they span um, outside of cannabis into healthcare, industrials, consumer staples, energy, and financials. Uh, those are all sectors by SIC code. Now, you, they're all related to cannabis, of course, 
but they're diversified out of purely cannabis. And so as a result, diversified companies with businesses that generate receivables and inventory, um, uh, you know, can raise debt. And the bigger you get, the more opportunity there is for debt. And the more diversified you are, the more opportunity there is for debt, which is exactly what has happened in Aurora um, if we use them, uh, continue to use them as an example. So just uh, two days ago, September 10th, Aurora announced a new facility with uh, Bank of Montreal and uh, two or three other, I think two other syndicate partners. So there's only five, let me get my proper hand up here, there's only five Schedule A banks um, in all of the country, so the big players uh, that are the Canadian banks, and three to the five of them are on this syndicate now uh, for uh, Aurora Cannabis. And it's a substantial deal. They announced a, a $200 million a bump to their existing credit facility, and of that $200 million bump, 160 was in term loans. Um, so again, the working capital piece is, is not the majority of this. And, and that's in addition to the 200 odd million that they placed last year. There's a first GSA, um, uh, general security uh, uh, PPSA registration on that uh, debt, which uh, if you're American is pretty much the exact same thing as your, your UCC filing. Um, and so it's first secured and uh, there's a revolving piece and a term piece, as I said. Aurora also announced uh, this fiscal year, or sorry, this calendar year, about a $345 million, what they called um, senior notes uh, placement. Um, and that was a public market issuance. And notwithstanding they're called senior notes, they're actually unsecured uh, at 5.5% uh, interest rate. Um, and so, you know, they were able to issue this $350 odd million of debt. That's in addition to the $400 million uh, BMO led syndication. In Canada, so as you can see, they got bigger, they diversified, and all of a sudden they're able to borrow a bunch of money from financial institutions and from and from uh, public public issuances. So not everything is equity uh, anymore. Certainly, if you're big enough and diversified enough, um, and and so there, there's one piece of the puzzle that's bringing more debt to the equation. Another piece of the puzzle is that the the um, the equity placements um, have now a convertible, uh, a lot of them have a convertible component. In other words, they're issued in debt, but they convert into shares. And so we took a look at that. You know, in the last 12 months, uh, if you look in Canada, there's been 359 financing placements, whether that be public or private, um, in the cannabis industry. And 87 of those were convertible debentures. So about 25% uh, had a debt component to them. And in the U.S., it was a bit higher. There was 236 uh, placements, public or private, and of that, 67 were convertible, so approximately 30%. So 30% in the U.S., 25% uh, in Canada of what you would think of as being an equity placement was, in fact, a debt placement uh, because there was a convertible piece to it. And so even those companies, you're starting to see uh, debt come into this industry where it wasn't before. And, of course, you know, you also got the traditional – mortgages, equipment financing, uh, that sort of thing. Bridge loans, uh, we've been involved in a bunch of uh, the bridge loans uh, to this sector. So it's, uh, it's a space where debt is creeping into it and where you have debt, you have an opportunity for uh, a requirement for a restructuring or a workout of some sort. And um, so that's a precondition is having the debt. And if you have the debt, now, what makes us think that there's a crunch coming, that there's going to be defaults on debt in the future? What's going on there? I mean, everything you read in the U.S. and Canada is telling you that there's going to be uh, a crunch in the cannabis sector, a shakeout. There's a bunch of M&A. There's going to be winners. There's going to be losers. Uh, things are going to happen, and, and a bunch of them are going to go bankrupt, right? E everywhere you read that. So let's just – I'm going to pick on the Canadian side of the border for a minute. Let's just look at some of the things that are going on. What might be driving – that sort of consensus. And the answer is, you know, if you look at most of uh, uh, the licensed uh, producers, that they have been pursuing aggressive expansion plans uh, with the hope of securing, you know, a big chunk of the market and driving down their costs per whatever, per unit, per kg, uh, because, you know, the, there's economies of scale. And they're also looking to, you know, branch out into other areas 
uh, that they may, not, may or may not be experts in and they're probably overpaying for those assets. We talked about that at CanTrust. Um, it's a concern at Aurora if you read some of their materials. Um, so there's a lot going on um, in terms of companies just wanting to be bigger and bigger and bigger in the Canadian marketplace. And so what you're seeing is um, if you take the aggregate of the major producers um, and their plans for 2020, 2021, 2021, they're looking at producing over 4 million kilograms, 4 million kilograms of, of cannabis, um, which is more than double, almost triple the expected demand um, in the Canadian marketplace. And that would be the legal demand, although there's some confusion over the stats associated with this. You know, one of the, one of the problems in Canada is the distribution channel. There's only 290 retail stores um, in the entire country that have been licensed and approved to sell this stuff, uh, to sell the cannabis legally. And if you care about, compare that to Colorado, I understand there's over 100,000 uh, locations that you can buy retail, uh, serving obviously a much smaller market. So the bottom line in Canada is there's a growth oversupply. Um, there's going to be a shakeout in the market. Um, there's going to be um, a drop in the commodity price. Uh, that's going to cause the high cost producers significant problem. And so there's going to be winners and losers. Uh, so you've got a bunch more debt coming into the industry. You've got a shakeout coming down the pipe. There's discussion of that in the U.S. There's discussion in Canada, and we talked about a Canadian example, Canadian example as to why that might happen. So what are the workout problems um, uh, in Canada and the U.S.? They're different, so we're going to do one country at a time. Um, and what we're going to find is that you can't just restructure these companies and go to the courts for help like you typically would in any other business, really. Um, it's, this is a significant problem uh, for both debtors being the company that's borrowed the money and creditors being the, the banks and or investors that have loaned money to these cannabis companies. So Canada, the primary issue that hinders and obstructs, uh, is going to hinder and obstruct formal workouts is the regulatory nature uh, the Health Canada licenses. So every single market participant in Canada requires a license that is issued uh, by Health Canada. And the license <coughs> is, it permits specific individuals to perform, perform specific tasks at a specific location, individual task location. It provides, the Cannabis Act provides no mechanism to transfer that license uh, to a different person or a different location. Um, and therefore, uh, you can't use it as collateral, right? There's no mechanism to use this as collateral for a loan. And therefore, a Health Canada license is not, in fact, a separate asset uh, that someone could realize on. Um, so if you're a bank and if you're BMO in the syndication, that's loaning to Aurora, there's no problem with Aurora, I don't expect any issue, but just by way of an example, um, <clears throat> and they think the primary value is the license, um, there's nothing they can do about that. They could try to act on it, but Health Canada is just gonna take the license away because it's a specific person performing a specific task at a specific location. And if you think that's hypothetical, just remember that it was just a year ago, um, it was still going on, it may still be going on, that a company could start from nothing, have a greenhouse, greenhouse is worth nothing, get a license, and all of a sudden they have a value of 50 to 100 to 125 million dollars um, in Canada just because they have a license. They have a greenhouse worth, say, a million dollars, um, and then they jump to 100 million dollars in value because they got a license. There's a lot of value on that license. Equity players are giving you money based on the valuation of that license, but it's not transferable. If you're a lender, you're just stuck with it. So there's a problem. <clears throat> um, so, you know, the license and the lack of transfer transferability um, severely hampers any collection um, and effort that goes along that. And even if you could transfer it, you don't have the individual. You know, for a cannabis company in Canada, anywhere down the line to operate, it must have a, a key person in charge, a security cleared individual to operate this thing 100% um, of the time, right? So if you are a receiver, 
Um, if you're a monitor, well, a monitor doesn't count because that's not an officer of the company, but if you're someone who's taking over the, the operations of the business, even a CRO, for example, um, you need to be security cleared um, and acceptable to Health Canada, um, you know, trained in this stuff. And that takes a long time. <clears throat> I don't know of anybody uh, apart from me who's going through the process of making sure their security cleared with Health Canada and ready to go to step in to operate one of these things uh, quickly, like tomorrow, uh, if need be. <clears throat> so there's a, just a highlight of the troubles um, in Canada. There's been very little examples. Ascent Industries would be one. Ascent is in uh, CCAA, which would be the Canadian uh, similarity, uh, I, I don't want to say comparable, yeah, Canadian comparable to a Chapter 11 um, in the U.S., so the company still operates, it still has its management team, it's going to court to seek the court's help, the court's help to uh, come up with a plan to compromise uh, uh, creditors, people that have loaned money to the company, and restructure the business, right? That's the essence of a Chapter 11. And so the Scent Industries in Canada um, and this would be similar to a can trust, which we've done two shows on, so I won't go over that again. But Ascent Industries had their license uh, suspended by Health Canada initially and then revoked uh, or threatened to be revoked by Health Canada. And when they had their license suspended for ill deeds, um, their revenue went to zero, uh, similar to a can trust situation. So they just, they just, uh, they're a public company, they ended up with no revenue, more or less overnight. Uh, they dealt with it badly, and as a result, they filed CCAA, um, and they sought protection. But that didn't do anything with Health Canada. <clears throat> Health Canada just never issued the license again. They threatened to revoke it. Um, well, in bankruptcy protection in CCAA, Companies Creditors Arrangements Act, um, Ascent was, uh, they hired a consultant, according to Ernst & Young, the monitor, and the consultant's job was to go to Health Canada um, and try to work something out so that the license could be transferred or sold. And you know the response they got from Health Canada? They got no answer. They just didn't respond, according to the monitor's report. And that's been the problem. You see that uh, at Ascent, you've seen it at CanTrust, there's been no timely response. And so how do you work out and restructure a company when you can't operate because you have no license and the primary regular regulator just isn't responding uh, because it's not their interest to do so. Presumably they have their own. This is not a complaint against Health Canada. They've got their own issues that they need to, to work through in these sorts of things and your restructuring is you know, probably not their primary concern. <clears throat> so they tried to sell this business ascent. Uh, they hired Clara Securities. There was three false starts. Um, and things just kept getting worse, and there was clearly no response coming from Health Canada. They could, clearly could not deliver the um, the license to anybody. Don't forget, specific person, specific task, specific location. And so um, they did end up with a sale. Uh, it's not disclosed in the court materials how much they got, but I can, I can tell you it did nothing for the stock. So it wasn't a bunch of money. Um, and there's an example in the Canadian marketplace of some of the troubles in restructuring a cannabis company. Uh, so in summary in Canada, you can't transfer the license. Um, you need a key person, a specific individual, 100% of the time. And people, the community at large in the insolvency and, and restructuring community, they're not qualified to be those people. And in times of distress, Health Canada has shown that they're not gonna respond uh, either at all or on a timely basis. So what are your options? To deal with that in Canada, I think the number one theme of today is going to be uh, a soft restructuring, not using courts, uh, do it on a friendly basis, work with a CRO, you know, a hired professional to come into the company, um, and preferably one that's security cleared and can take authority and could do these negotiations and use the fact that this is difficult uh, to your favor if you're the company um, and try to use that because the lender is equally prejudiced or even more prejudiced by the fact that you can't get in front of a judge and and have your dealt your claim dealt with in a in a way that you see appropriate and so those are your options do it friendly do it with the cro um and m a you know try and do an m a long ahead of time you know sell this company if it looks like it's it's going down so that's canada let's move to the u.s 
what are the problems in the U.S.? And here, you're still going to have, you know, state by state, the same regulatory uh, issues, not nearly as severe as in Canada, because it's not nearly as regulated as in Canada. But the real problem in the U.S. is that cannabis is legal in states. So you've got really only three states uh, in the U.S. where cannabis is completely legal. You have 11, I think, where it's completely legal, and 36 where you have a hybrid largely it's legal for medicinal purposes. Um, but federally, it's illegal throughout. Um, so you have this disconnect in the law. So as long as you're operating within your state, uh, you're legal. If you leave your state, um, or if you're looking to use federal law to help you in restructuring, then uh, you can't. And, and bankruptcy law in the US, uh, same as Canada, is federal law. And so, so you're stuck because what has happened is that the cannabis companies are have been effectively prohibited uh, from filing bankruptcy in the United States. So in other words, they can't go to the court, uh, file bankruptcy like a, a Chapter 11 or Chapter whatever, Chapter 7 for liquidation. You, you can't go to the court and seek their help to restructure and sell your assets. And the reason for that is that the, uh, the trustee or the courts have said, that a bankruptcy trustee in the U.S. cannot administer the assets without violating federal law. In other words, you know, the Bankruptcy Act creates an estate. The bankruptcy trustee becomes the administrator of that estate, and they're now on a federal level uh, conducting a business that is illegal. Uh, to so and so, the courts won't let them do that. Um, and also, uh, the courts have said that uh, these Chapter 11, Chapter 13 bankruptcy plans. Um, violate a section of the Bankruptcy Code 1129 to be exact, um, uh, which is a good faith requirement that, you know, you, you act legally at all times. And so they're throwing out cases based on that as well. An example of this would be the Mother Earth, uh, Mother Earth dismissed in Chapter 11 for those uh, filing for those two reasons. And I won't go on into the details of that right now, but, but uh, that has happened. So state solutions are the only answer. If you're in Colorado, you can't file uh, and you're directly uh, into the marijuana business. You can't use bankruptcy laws uh, to help you. So you look to state solutions. What are state solutions? Uh, they would include state uh, receiverships, um, assignment for the benefit of cre creditors, ABC transactions, um, state procedures for winding up the affairs of the company, um, other remedies available to senior creditors under the uh, UCC filing, uh, which I think means uh, <coughs> simply a foreclosure. And uh, same under the mortgages, uh, state mortgages law. Uh, you could foreclose on the real estate or what have you. And so every one of those things has some pros and some cons, but it has a lot of cons. Um, and you're going to need to, but those, that's what's available to you, uh, legally speaking. And so you're going to need to, to deal with your state lawyer. And if you're in multiple states, it, it just becomes way more complicated uh, for you. So those are the issues. Here's another big issue in the United States that people are not thinking about, which is the related businesses to cannabis, marijuana. So the, the, uh, if you're directly involved in the marijuana business, um, you're, you're definitely out from using bankruptcy as a solution to help restructure uh, and work out your company. And so what was directly involved I mean it would be um, uh, growers, manufacturers, distributors, um, and sale, anywhere at the sale. So you're in that business, you're out of the bankruptcy courts. But here's what else, is that the US trustee has taken the position that if you're a landlord, if you own a bunch of commercial space and you have nothing to do with cannabis, but you lease space to a state legalized marijuana company, uh, you are also precluded from, uh, from the bankruptcy courts. And the underlying position of the Controlled Substances Act is that there's no distinction between a seller, a grower, um, and those that are renting space to a seller or a grower or someone directly involved in this business. So you could have a portfolio of real estate all over the US and you could have one or two that, um, you know, th that are in the cannabis business and you could be, and it, it may not be a material issue um, for your restructuring in terms of the cash flow or the tenant, but you may be precluded or it's significantly gonna become an issue 
um, for you using the benefit of the bankruptcy court. Big issue for lenders, of course. You're lending to real estate companies. You don't think you're lending, uh, lending to the cannabis business. And all of a sudden, you have this issue. Something to look out for. Case on that would be, say, Arm Ventures uh, in Florida. And again, I won't go over the details of this uh, uh, for the interest of time. Also, because I'm not a lawyer and it sort of bores me, but you know, the, the conclusion is important. Uh, supplies, you want to talk about related industry. Supplies, there's, there's case law in um, Way to Grow, Inc. And these guys were in the hydroponics business and gardening supplies. Uh, so they're selling hardware and gardening supplies not to the cannabis business, but they were thinking about growing into the cannabis business, if you forgive the pun. They are thinking about supplying. I mean, it's, but they, you know, the bulk of their business was to other crops and they too were precluded from using uh, bankruptcy protection um, uh, on the same basis as, as the other examples that I provided that, you know, a material part of their plan or, you know, part of their plan going forward is to sell to an illegal, to an illegal industry. So you really need to be aware of that. You may not even think you're in cannabis and you're being ousted uh, from bankruptcy protection in the U.S. Here's another big one, hemp. Um, everybody knows or thinks that hemp is completely legal in the United States. And I know a handful of lenders uh, in, in both countries that will not lend to the cannabis business. They will not lend to marijuana, but they'll lend to hemp because, as far as they know, hemp is legal. And what's interesting is that hemp is not as legal as you might think that it is. Um, there's a lot of details around that. Um, what's happened is in 2018, the Controlled Substances Act excluded from the definition of marijuana, effectively uh, hemp and the THC, more specifically the THC that is derived from hemp. And you know the distinction between hemp and cannabis is the hemp plant uh, by definition would have 0.3% THC um, uh, or less. Whereas cannabis plants can have a lot of THC, like up to 30%, in, I think, in dried weight um, THC. And this is the, you know, the psy psychoactive substance that causes the uh, uh, marijuana to become uh, uh, an illegal substance on the Control Substance Act. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, hemp is therefore legal in the sense that it's excluded from the Controlled Substance Act and hemp is used a lot or almost entirely for CBD oil and CBD oil is used in ointments and uh, just as an oil like I take some I put it underneath my tongue and there's all sorts of you know health reasons to to want to take CBD but what's interesting is CBD also comes from a marijuana plant and when you distill and come up with your isolate, your, your compound for CBD, a compound is a compound. It doesn't matter if it came from hemp or if it came from cannabis, it's the exact same compound. So how do you tell the difference? How do you know that your hemp business uh, is legal? And here's some issues uh, when, uh, or th things to think about, because my proposition is 100%, there are gonna be lenders uh, and borrowers in the hemp industry that is going to turn out are in the cannabis marijuana business, uh, either on purpose or mistakenly. Um, and they're going to be, they're going to have regulatory problems, but it's also going to be relevant to our discussion today. They're not going to be able to seek protection for the exact same reason. So first of all, you can't tell the difference between a cannabis plant, a marijuana plant and a hemp plant, uh, really just by looking at it. I was doing some research and talking to some experts on this, you really can't tell the difference. It's uh, you need to get into the chemistry of it. So there's a lot of there's a lot of um, cause for confusion. And thanks to the miracle, this is somebody's article. I'm stealing a little bit from here, but they, they call it the miracle of reproduction. A hemp crop can start off being completely CBD, and then unwittingly through through reproduction, turn into a THC laden cannabis marijuana field. Um, and, you know, I work uh, with some hemp companies um, and help to run those. And, you know, the growers would call this going hot. They, they've gone from no THC to way over the 0.3% THC. They've gone from legal uh, to illegal. Think about it. You're growing a completely legal um, 
a hemp crop and through nothing you did, it suddenly turns into a marijuana crop loaded with THC. Studies have found that um, two certifiable hemp plants that have no THC um, and they reproduce in their offspring, another hemp plant, uh, may make THC. In fact, some of them only make THC. The, the, the distinction between hemp and cannabis is really small um, and, and there is dormant THC, if I could put it that way, without getting too scientific, um, in a hemp plant and it risks turning on. So just, I mean, it's crazy to think about if you're a lender um, and you've loaned to a, a, a hemp grow, which, you know, we're doing right now in California. Um, we're on that. I have to hang up from this show and actually talk to those people uh, right now. Um, and that grow could turn into <laughs> could turn into a cannabis uh, marijuana plant. Crazy to think about. Um, so there's one way your hemp deal can get in trouble. Um, processing is another way. So you got the the you've got the uh, you, you've harvested. You got the dry bud. Now you need to send it to a processor, right? And they're going to extract and they're going to isolate the CBD. Except the exact same process is used for isolating the the THC. And there's all sorts of ways for your processor to screw that up and for you to end up not with a pure CBD product, um, but rather um, an illegal uh, product with too high of a THC uh, level. And so there's a bunch of uh, independent labs um, and there's uh, educators and study people studying people studying in the U.S. And they go around to gas stations and corner stores and grocery stores and they're buying pure CBD oil and they're testing it, and what they're coming back with is most of it is illegal. It's a crapshoot. You have no idea what you're getting. No one's testing this stuff. There's no controls, and it, it may have started out as a pure hemp CBD play, um, and it's getting it's it's turning into a legal product along the way. So obviously a regulatory concern with that, but also um, relevant to our conversation today. I don't think it's happened yet, but my view is if you're if you're deemed, if you could be challenged to be really a marijuana play and not a hemp business, um, you're not going to be able to restructure your business similar to every other marijuana company uh, that we talked about earlier. And the last point I want to make on hemp is people say it's, it's completely legal. Um, that's not true. Um, what it does by being removed from the uh, Controlled, Sub Controlled Substances Act is it takes it out of the authority of the DEA as a regulator, but it's still regulated by the FDA. And what the FDA has said is you can't sell uh, CBD um, in a food product um, or with a health claim and or with a health claim. So really, anything you see with, um, with food, um, uh, ingestibles, um, uh, moistures, I think would be put like creams, topicals would be part of that, um, or anything that has a health claim. So anything that's not just pure oil with no claim on it whatsoever um, is not approved by the FDA, um, although it's approved by a bunch of states. So you get this, this same disconnect between federal uh, regulation and state regulation, the exact same as the marijuana business. Um, so anyways, there's an overview of the U.S. and the problems that you're going to have in restructuring and staying legal uh, in the US marketplace. A little interesting nuance, let's talk about cross-border. Sometimes you have companies with a Canadian presence and a US presence, and if you do, it hasn't been tested yet in the courts as far as I know, but it raises a really interesting opportunity to affect the restructuring. Um, and just for some context, um, we did some research, I had uh, Olga did some research uh, for us. You remember her from other shows, and she'll be back next week, I'm excited to say. Um, and Olga, uh, we came up with, including hemp, 34 companies with a Canadian presence that also have a U.S. presence. So that's, it's not a huge number of companies that are across border. Um, and I think that's because many of the U.S. companies are regional, and uh, all of the large Canadian companies don't want to don't want access to the U.S. market because it's federally legal and they have problems crossing the border, and no one wants to do that. They all want to go on holidays in Florida. So, but the extent that you have this cross border, um, you can come up with a chapter 15 solution, which is you could use the Canadian solvency courts. So let's say you've got your, your licenses in the US, you've, you've sidestepped this healthcare, health candidate issue altogether, and you have the, um, you have your license, uh, sorry, your license in the US, I already said, 
but you have a presence in Canada, you use the Canadian insolvency courts and a chapter 15 in the US, which is a chapter that works as an ancillary, ancillary um, uh, filing. So the primary driver is Canada. Um, the US is a follow on. It does not create an estate, so it sidesteps this whole US trustee issue. And uh, the legal thinking is that may be a really creative way to affect the restructuring, so much so that some are calling for US companies to, to set up in Canada um, specifically for that purpose. And as I said, I haven't seen it yet, but, um, but it's an interesting little nuance. So we're 35 minutes into a detailed, uh, boring topic on the problems with restructuring. So I'm gonna wrap this up for today uh, before my internet quits. Um, but here's what I want you to remember. Um, there's all sorts of problems, no matter what jurisdiction you're in. There's going to be regulatory problems like Health Canada. There's going to be court problems in the U.S. because of it's not federally legal. The state solutions are not great. You need to be aware of this when you enter into a deal, whether you're debtor or creditor, you need to be aware of that. You need to think ahead to friendly, soft restructurings. You need to use a CRO um, and you need to try and stay out of court and you need to talk to your solvency lawyers in detail up front so you have strategies for this. Uh, that's all for today and uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Let's see if we can get some more music on to close this, close this off. Uh, what else do I want to tell you? Uh, you can reach me as normal at uh, the Sinclair Range website, S-I-N-C-L-A-I-R-R-A-N-G-E.com. Um, or leave a, a comment on YouTube and we will uh, get back to you. Ashley will probably pick that up. Please subscribe. And that's it for me. Talk to you guys later. <laughs>